This is Dr. Versalati. I just wanted to go over a couple of notes that I had about morphemes and morphology. The first important note that struck me as I was reading uh, this chapter is the idea that the sound meaning relation is arbitrary. What does that mean? That the sound meaning relation ship is arbitrary. Well, let's take a word like um, a star. So in English, we say the word star, but um, that's an arbitrary connection for the idea of a star, the concept. We could say estrella, like um, people who speak Spanish say, or really just sticking inside English, we could have used whatever um, sound we wanted to represent the word star, that concept. So this concept could have been bar or har or um, sta. It, it could be anything. It's arbitrary and only through repeated use of what speakers say um, that that's how it, it sticks, right? If we all agree that we're going to call that a star, then it's a star, but that relationship is arbitrary, that pairing. The, uh, some other important ideas about a morpheme, it's a minimal linguistic unit, it's the arbitrary unit between a sound in the meaning or a grammatical function that cannot be further analyzed, and that it's very important that the meaning of a morpheme must be constant. Um, later on um, in the chapter, the authors talk about rule productivity. Now the authors do not put them in quotes, um, but I do because as we have talked about, uh, there are not um, so much rules of, of language use, but patterns. And I just wanted to uh, point that out. Um, so speakers of a language, this is the quote, speakers of a language must know the sound meaning correspondence quote, as well as the rules that determine how they are added to the root or a stem, unquote. So um, I agree with the idea, but not the use of the uh, word rules. I think that was just like a shortcut for the idea of the patterns, um, because as we know, there really are not strict rules. In that same chapter, uh, the authors say that certain patterns um, and I'm using the word patterns there, um, are uh, most acceptable and others become less likely. So really the idea of what we can do is on a continuum um, of, of what prefixes and suffixes can go on to which stems and which, and, and the same is true for um, sentences. There are certain patterns that are most acceptable and others that become less likely. So it's not categorical um, rule, like a rule, but it's more um, on a continuum of what patterns do we see most often, what patterns are more accepted by more speakers, and which patterns are less acceptable. Uh, and the other point that it's not really a rule but a, just a pattern is that there are gaps. Um, there are certain, if it were a rule, we would, like math, we could just add one to whatever the stem is and it would be okay. But there are some things that are, are dispreferred. So all this to say is that in language we're going to talk about patterns and not rules. We didn't learn language following rules. We just heard lots and lots of um, words and lots of lots of um, sentences. And from that, we um, learned the patterns and what patterns um, we can play with and what patterns um, we can play a lot with and what patterns we can't play that much with. I think this will also help us as teachers because as soon as we give a rule, um, a student will find uh, an exception to it. So it's, uh, I find it to be much more um, successful to say these are the patterns 
and if a student finds an example that doesn't follow the pattern, it is a teachable moment to talk about, well, why, why do you think maybe the pattern doesn't hold here? And it requires more thinking on the part of the student. The student can become more active rather than in a rule that is to be memorized, which is less active. There's less thinking going on. Um, so those are my thoughts about this chapter.